yeah i also feel that the way the the positions the students have been placed in is a position that students should not have to deal with quite honestly but well uh maybe i'll begin by saying that i've got 99 problems as well as 99 slides so get ready <laughs> but nzz ain't one uh and what i mean by that besides the joke is um that i feel we should uh you know we should keep our outrage not so much at uh the sort of uh and newspapers that have like tabloid methods uh, to slander people and to try to put pressure on whatever they're putting pressure on and rather focus our trade on uh, those who knows very well how much they're lying and yet actually accept to play their game and um, and uh, and this is what happens with ETH so as a that's why I, I never reacted to any of those um just yeah like shitty articles uh but uh, yeah this censorship of this uh, of this uh, lecture had to be had had to be called out for sure and i'm very grateful to the 1800 people who signed the letter in a little bit more than 24 hours it was sent to the to the rector today um but so let's begin i mean perhaps just uh introducing myself very quickly also because you know uh, indeed in those articles i'm i'm under attack for my work so at least here i get to present it my my main cap uh is to be the editor-in-chief of the phenomenalist which is um uh which is where i am right now our little office uh it's just two of us shivangi Mariam raj and myself and very i'm uh, let me do a small shoot out to Shivangi Mariam actually, because yesterday we had to act extremely fast. And so uh, both with the students and, and two of us at the office, we we had to, uh, it was quite an intense day. And so The Phenomenalist is this uh, print and online magazine that is dedicated to what I call the politics of space and bodies, uh, trying to read various political struggles around the world uh, through space directly or indirectly and uh, cultivating uh, internationalist solidarities uh, between those different struggles uh, so those are some of our most recent issues uh, and this is the most recent one um, the that's a march april 2024 and then the the next one is uh, actually being printed as we speak uh, or should be printed as we speak, actually. Um, and then I have a second cap, which is a little bit closer to my training as an architect. Um, and that, it, and perhaps it, perhaps a phenomenalist could be said to bring uh, space and architecture to the realms of politics. Um, and uh, my cap as a writer, let's call it. Although I always have like a little bit of an imposter syndrome when I when I when I think of writer, um, is to is to perhaps do the opposite to bring politics to architecture. Although some some um, sometime it's a little bit uh, the other way around as well. Uh, but so this was the first book that I wrote now fifteen years ago. Very much uh, still on. In the topic of today's uh, today's talk, uh, this one was a more recent one that I'll talk about uh, in in a bit called "Build Other Politics," and this one was the most recent one uh, that is actually currently being translated into into English, which I'm quite happy about by Columbia Books uh, for this architecture and the city um, books of architecture and the city. Uh, called States of Emergency, a spatial history of the French colonial continuum. Uh, but that's not quite the topic today. Um, and I begin, of course, <laughs> with uh, the motivation for completely changing the lecture and basically spending most of my day today trying to, to recreate something, which is uh, this uh, two slash uh, uh, statement that ETH, ETH uh, did um, to censor the lecture uh, with this very particular sentence that I feel, you know, of course, in many ways, uh, as we know all too well, is a lawyer <laughs> written sentence. It's trying to not to say something without saying it. Uh, but I found the very idea of distancing oneself uh, from violence, a very interesting concept. 
a very Swiss concept, if any, if any way. Uh, 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 but uh, the fact in the matter is, um, many people in and in particular Palestinians don't quite have the luxury to be able to distance themselves from violence because violence is coming at them. And so that that made me want to to do this talk uh, and to call it uh, um, when the walls tighten on on you uh, on Palestinian impossibility to distance with to distance from by architecture's violence. And so it's if some of you have been seeing the um, seeing the teachings that I gave in November uh, about the architecture of settler colonialism in Palestine. I will be honest, maybe some part of this lecture might might feel a little bit redundant, but hopefully you'll bear with me. It's really not all of it. Um, I think a, one of the main difference is perhaps the place of architecture in the a little bit more, uh, yeah, a little bit more architectural centric uh, today. Uh, and a main difference as well is that for that teaching, it was very important to me that um, every document I use for the presentation was mine uh, to keep like a very strong consistency, even a graphic consistency. In the case of today's lecture, it's a little bit more uh, mixed between uh, documents, whether photos or maps or diagrams or whatever else uh, that are mine and then and then some some that came from, that comes from other places. So um, yeah, I don't know. I mean if you if you've seen it then you'll you'll be able to tell the the similarities and differences. But so let's begin indeed with uh, what architecture's violence even means since it's in the very title of of, um, of this talk. And um, perhaps I should even, before doing so, even define violence. But and uh, also perhaps without necessarily defining it as such, I would say that uh, my understanding of violence is very much influenced by um, a sort of Spinozist reading of violence, so uh, something that comes from the philosoph philosophy of Spinoza. Um, and the idea of it is is that it's profoundly material and it has to do with the body and it has to do with bodies. It has to do with the sort of um, mm, damaging of the sort of uh, a body's structural integrity, even if body in that case might be architecture itself. And so and so it's a reading of violence that's yeah, profoundly material. And so architecture has a role to play in it, of course. And in particular, uh, with the definition of architecture, that's been the, my definition that I've been giving for the last 15 years, which is that architecture is a discipline that organizes bodies in space. Uh, and I quite like uh, uh, quite like showing this uh, this uh, scene from, I mean, the, the sort of the entire setting of the film Dogville by uh, a not so a not so admirable uh, director for various reasons. Lars von Trier, um, but so how how the entire uh, films happen in this what is supposed to be this village, but where the walls are only uh, even though the walls are effective in the film, we see it as spectators as only the as only lines uh, on the on the floor, but that still organizes bodies in space. And I, I'm already talking about walls, and I'll get back to it in just a second. But an example I like to give to talk about how architecture is politically violent, um, even without any walls, even with just a roof, like a bus stop can be uh, in a heavy rain. Uh, and, and thinking of it in this particular context of a heavy rain, whereby, um, whereby if, um, you know, uh, we, I mean, at least for people, uh, some so those of us who live in Western Europe, uh, chances mm -hmm. are that we've had to uh, take shelter from heavy rain um, under uh, a bus stop or whatever canopy, and then there comes there comes a moment where there's no longer any space because you know each body sort of occupies a certain space and architecture in itself is limited limited in space, and so there comes this moment where there's no longer any sort of uh, um, there's no longer any possibility to include bodies within uh, architecture's function and protection and and uh, and the sort of positivity of architecture, so to speak. 
And so it creates a situation whereby um, um, some bodies get included and some bodies get excluded from architecture. And in the case of a bus stop, of course, it's not that political. I mean, if, if all bodies are more or less uh, equal politically, let's say, it's not, which is seldom the case anyway, but um but um but but the fact the fact and the matter remains that uh when uh when there is a situation where someone can no longer benefit from architecture they are they are socially excluded from it and of course what is true for this somewhat benign example for uh of a bus stop becomes much more drastic for other uh other example um and you know uh the the sort of perhaps the most paradigmatic example of uh of exclusion exclusion uh uh processes as that architecture form might be the regime of private property in particular uh and so if we do talk with about walls and again like really thinking of the the materiality of walls and and going back to the idea of what is a wall to begin with and um, and seeing how walls are almost exclusively all uh, built in such a way that bodies cannot really affect them, at least affect them drastically, at least not affect affect them drastically in a, in a sort of like short scale of time. Um, so I like, I like those photos from Café Müller by uh, Pina Bausch because uh, there's this uh, quite violent uh, uh, encounter between the walls and and those dancers, uh, including Pina Bash herself, um, that that very much materializes what I call the violence of the walls, the fact that the wall forces bodies to be organized in space. Um, and if we no longer think of one wall, but a sort of a, an adjustment of wall or a sort of... Um, I mean, you know, an organization of walls in space. Uh, then we can we can start seeing how um, those walls have um, uh, what what kind of political regime is being enacted in this organization of bodies in space. And uh, and uh, I usually uh, I usually like to think about this uh, with the typology of um, of corridors. Uh, you know, I the way I approach architecture in a theoretical way tends to be about like, okay, what is a wall? What is what is a roof? What is a corridor? What is and you'll see a little bit later about a few other examples. And a corridor is is pretty much um, a space made out of usually two walls that are um, very much implementing and and enforcing as a displacement of as a as movement of bodies between po two points. Uh, and quite often between only one point to another in only one direction. And of course, those, this example is pretty extreme of uh, the way uh, Temple Grandin has been sort of imagining um, uh, corridors for cattle to be uh, brought to their death in a, in a slaughterhouse in what she described as being a more humane way. And I think whether it is more humane or not is not really uh, up for grab uh, right here. But the fact and the matter is, is that the the cattle the cattle is being driven from one point to another through this sort of very architectural uh, scheme, and of course this is something that is true at a, at a more human centric uh, level, and uh, in the case of a settler colonial regime such as the one at work in Palestine, those corridors in in uh, in checkpoints that we'll go back to in in a moment. Uh, are very much uh, designed with the exact same sort of uh, uh, ambition. And what I usually say is that what you're seeing right now, those careers, they would be a very easy way. I mean, there would be a way to not rely on architecture to have the exact same um, organization of bodies in space, which would be pretty much to line up a whole bunch of like armed Israeli soldiers 24-7, um, uh, 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 every, I don't know, every two meters or something like that, and then force uh, Palestinian workers to go uh, in that, um, uh, through them every morning to go to their work, so those, those who have a permit to actually uh, cross the checkpoint. Uh, but architecture does this with an economy of means and, and uh, an economy of means that is much greater than having like this kind of row of soldiers. So architecture does the work of soldiers, of colonial soldiers, uh, in a way that is much more, um, yeah, that that is 
much cheaper in in every sense of of chip. So I think this is also always something to keep in mind. And then if I if I just go a little bit uh, further uh, in in this sort of examination of architectural element, of course this is not the main uh, object of the of the talk today, but I think it was it's important for me to place those sort of theoretical this theoretical background to talk about what's next. Uh, and so if we look, it, we looked at we very briefly looked at what is a wall, very briefly looked at what is a corridor, and then. Within the very concept of a wall, there's uh, there needs to be a little bit more flexibility to it, and this is why we invented this little architectural invention uh, called the door, uh, which basically is a wall that can um, allow some sort of perme permeability uh, for the wall to no longer be a wall, so to speak. But in doing so, and again, like purposely using uh, very tangible to opposing this this theory with very tangible example uh, uh, in Palestine, uh, we can see also how even a small door becomes a vulnerability uh, in the scheme of organization of bodies in space because you create you created this this one moment within the wall that is uh, that can potentially turn into not a wall. And so that creates a vulnerability for the political regime that tries to use the wall. And so this is why there is a, the, the door usually comes with another invention that I'm quite uh, uh, passionate about, which is called the lock and the key. Uh, that basically, um, you know, those processes of inclusion and exclusion that I was talking about uh, with the bus stop and, and, and naming private property. Well, the key does that. Like the key is basically this very little object that uh, gets to decide who um, who can act on architecture and therefore we can sort of like uh, um, who can sort of navigate through it in a way that those who don't have the key uh, would not be able. And of course, the key doesn't have to be a literal key every time. Uh, but basically every example that I'm about to give in the context of Palestine can be can be very much interpreted with that. Um, image of a key. Uh, and so if we now talk about indeed the Palestinian distance from architecture's violence, uh, starting somewhat, I mean, it's a little bit, it's, it's, it's a little bit strange perhaps to say it like that, but for, for each chapter, I try to, to get a little bit closer from architecture's violence, uh, for each typology, but perhaps putting back a little bit of, uh, a little bit of geo histographic, hist his historical, um, uh, elements uh, for like bearing in mind that not everyone uh, who's here might have the exact same sort of degree of historical and geographical knowledge on, on Palestine. Um, so when it comes to Palestine, uh, um, uh, what's important, what's important is to understand that uh, it's, it is not just what we when we name Palestine, we don't we don't necessarily just mean the West Bank and Gaza or or East Jerusalem, but the entire historical Palestine. So Israel or what Palestinians call forty eight Palestine, is very much uh, part of uh, this geography, and that's a geography that's been uh, of course um, um, uh, that's been fundamentally impacted by the 1948 Nakba uh, when uh, a few months preceding the end of the British colonial mandate on Palestine, uh, Zionist paramilitary uh, groups uh, started to invade um, uh, uh, villages all around all around Palestine. Those are the, the villages here, the little uh, white dots each time. Um, and uh, including massacre and uh, enacting uh, an, an ethnic cleansing that uh, displaced uh, over 750,000 Palestinians, which was uh, half of the half of the Palestinians um, at the time, um, and uh, and and that led. I mean, the fact that uh, the the entire ethnic cleansing. The ethnic cleansing of the entire Palestine could not be enacted in time for uh, first the Zionist uh, paramilitary groups and then the, the Israeli army once the state of Israel was created on May 15, 1948. Uh, it created those two uh, those two uh, territories of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. 
the West Bank under Jordanian administration, as the Gaza Strip under Egyptian uh, administration. But then this changed during uh, what uh, Palestinians call the Naqsa in 1967, in June 1967 when the Israeli army, in just a matter of a few days, invaded uh, no less than four different uh, territories as a Jolan in, um, in, uh, in Syria, that, it's still, uh, that, it, that is still annexed to Israel today. Uh, the West Bank still occupied today, as a Gaza Strip still occupied today, and as a Sinai, uh, the entire Sinai Peninsula that uh, um, uh, Egypt managed to gain back since then. Uh, uh, and so, and so, whenever we are talking about those different regions, uh, those two sort of funda fundamental events are uh, are always important to keep in mind. Uh, this is a map uh, that I always try to show as a, as something as comprehensive as possible. Although because it's so comprehensive, perhaps uh, it's a little bit messy, and hopefully it won't be too much. Uh, but trying to show the various um, the various dimensions through which architecture is mobilized in the settler colonial condition of Palestine, uh, all over Palestine, and that includes, of course, uh, the colonies. We'll go back to it. Uh, the the way the West Bank is uh, the various the various ways through which the West Bank is is occupied, and um, and also how it operates with the the Palestinian Authority since the Oslo Accords. Um, uh, but also uh, those uh, those villages in uh, forty eight Palestine that have been um, uh, that have been uh, evicted in nineteen forty eight and destroyed. We'll we'll go back to it as well, as well as Palestinian Bedouin uh, 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 villages that are systematically destroyed still today, and of course the 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 the, 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 the blockade on Gaza uh, that have been going on for uh, for thirty years now. Uh, I mean, uh, the wall has been existing for thirty years, and uh, and um, and uh, blockade itself for uh, almost twenty years. Uh, so, if we look at if we look at different architectural typologies through which colonialism is enacted, uh, we can start uh, with the fort and the fort that also became the police station later on, and then we can also that also allows us to. Um, to talk about the British colonial mandate as well, because of course uh, colonialism uh, in Palestine um, is is a uh, is a story that um, um, is a history that um, that precedes 1948, and in particular, uh, the looking at this particular uh, character here in the center uh, called Charles Tigert, um, and I. I tend to do that a lot, like looking at the British colonial uh, colonial continuum, uh, looking at how Charles Tigert very much embodies this, this colonial continuum as uh, a Protestant settler born in Derry in Ireland, in what is called now the Northern Ireland, but uh, the north of Ireland. Uh, Derry being like probably the most uh, fierce uh, um, um, uh, city in the in the Irish Republican Army uh, history, but with also uh, a certain amount of of settlers living there, and and Tigert, the Tigert family being one of them, and Charles Tigert was also the chief of police uh, in uh, colonized uh, Kolkata, um, in Bengal, um, and then later on moved on to uh, be the sort of uh, military architect of forts that uh, kept his name uh, Tigert Fort. Uh, to very much crack crack down on uh, uh, the Palestinian revolt of the 1930s. Um, uh, uh, that was a, a massive uh, strike and revolt. And so build those forts to very much consolidate uh, the the colonial, uh, the British colonial presence in Palestine, but with already, of course, Zionism being already very much uh, uh, something at work in Palestine. Uh, of course, not at all in the same uh, to the same degree of violence and the same degree of of uh, engagement as in forty seven and forty eight, but still in the thirties it was it was far from being absent from Palestine. So those forts are to be considered uh, as in this context as well. And then those forts still exist today. Are, are as you can see this this one in in the very very north of uh, of Galilee. Um, and uh, and you know what used to be British colonial forts now are uh, 
are now are now uh, part of the Israeli um, heritage, so to speak. Also, I mean, you know, some of them are are still active. Some are more monuments. Uh, but then, what forts do in the context of uh, you know in settler colonial context, you can think of the fort like every time you hear the name of a city in Turtle Island, like in 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 uh, the U.S. or Canada. Uh, a city being named Fort something, I mean, uh, uh, Fort Lutendal, Fort Worth, that's very much because it was a fort uh, against uh, the indigenous nations uh, resistance. And so uh, it still have to be perceived as such in the context of Palestine, uh, with police stations being um, uh, being part of it. Uh, and as well, of, of course, uh, military uh, bases in um, in the West Bank, uh, like this, I mean, it's pretty bad photo I took uh, in in May, but also, you know, try trying not to be so obvious about taking photos. Uh, but of this, um, of this, uh, um, of this military base in the in um, in the Bejala at the in the very western part of Bethlehem, uh, where you have an Israeli uh, colonial military base very much inside the Palestinian city. The colony itself maybe brings us a little bit closer, and uh, I uh, purposely uh, chose some um, try try to insist on on the proximity uh, uh, between uh, Palestinian um, uh, presence and uh, and the Israeli colony. But as I said, it's important when we think of the colony not to think strictly in terms of uh, the West Bank, as we as uh, we often do. And it's quite interesting how in the ETH statement, they were willing to recognize that th there was a legitimacy in looking at the Israeli colonies in the in the West Bank that are in uh, in um, in um, contravention of the of the of the forced Geneva Convention. But I think it's very important to see how uh, uh, following the the Nakba in 1948, um, uh, the Israeli uh, uh, cities and settlements that were built in 48 Palestine are also to be considered as colony, and this is one of the main examples south of Tel Aviv, uh, uh, where tourists go uh, to enjoy the beach, uh, 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 very much in between Jaffa and uh, and Tel Aviv. You had the former neighborhood of uh, Al Manshir. The Palestinian neighborhood that was completely leveled to the ground in 1948 by a Zionist paramilitary group uh, called uh, the Yagorn. Um, and this is a museum built uh, in their honor uh, of the liberator of Jaffa, as the Zionist narrative say. Um, uh, that is built very much that is built on a former uh, commercial Palestinian building. So they they added this uh, very ugly. So it's always also striking, uh, ha having been in the southwest of the U.S. Uh, uh, driving quite a lot uh, last October, it was really striking to me how ugly the colony is as well. There's there's always something to it that is quite quite interesting. I mean, it's highly subjective, but I think we can all agree that this little black box uh, with bad, uh, you know, as architects, if we look to it, uh, even without any sort of political uh, reading, uh, we can already say how, how incredibly ugly it is. Anyway, um, very in Jaffa as well, I mean, the, the complicity of, archi of uh, Israeli architects or international architects uh, to, um, to build over uh, Palestinian land is, of course, uh, absolutely striking. Uh, same thing in in Haifa, for example, where in that case you even have like you know one of our typical architectural rendering uh, of showing a brand new building on top of a former um, a former Palestinian building that was uh, evicted and and left abandoned in 1948. Uh, and then importantly, you know, I I said. I'll go back to the colonies in the West Bank, but there are some things that ought to be talked about as, as well, especially with Gaza being uh, in the center of our of our um, imaginary at the moment. Is that there used to be colonies in uh, colonies in in uh, in Gaza as well until two thousand five, so they used to be there where, and they look to they used to look like that. Um, and they were uh, unilaterally um, evicted by the Israeli state in 2005 
uh, and completely level to the ground to leave to leave nothing like for example those greenhouses to the Palestinians after that. And of course, uh, in 2008, it became all too clear why those those colonies had been destroyed and evicted, uh, which was to leave um, to leave um, um, to leave uh, Gaza as being you know uh, uh, totally uh, bl blockaded and uh, and uh, bombable if if that's not really a word, but um, uh, without without us any sort of fear that. Uh, Israeli settlers would be uh, sort of in the way, so to speak. Uh, so that's also an important part of the history of colonies in Palestine. And then if we look at the West Bank itself, uh, something I've been trying to do is to, to make a list and, and look closely at each of those colonies in the West Bank. So that's something you can see on the map on the right, but perhaps to, to explain this map that I call the Palestinian archipelago, although I'm, I'm not the first one to have done such a map and to call it like that. Um, I realized after doing this map that a French artist called Julien Boussac had already done it, so nothing new there. But uh, but you can, you can see that those islands are... Um, Essentially, the uh, what in the West Bank we call Area A and Area B, which following the 1993 and 4 uh, Oslo Accords uh, were, were to be the area, are, are the areas where the Palestinian Authority had uh, a certain um, uh, political autonomy of sort um, and with, um, with the Israeli state, be, the Israeli army, uh, remaining uh, the full uh, manager of the rest of the 63% of, of the West Bank. And of course, as we've seen many, many times in the past few months, as the Israeli army retained absolutely the right to uh, penetrate within those islands and, uh, and arrest, red, kill uh, people, um, uh, including in the very center of Palestinian city, uh, whether in the middle of the night or in the middle of the day. Uh, and so, so yeah, so those areas where there is a tiny Palestinian uh, autonomy, and when I say Palestinian, I am being careful here because that's really the Palestinian Authority, and 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 um, and uh, whatever whatever legitimacy they they had in the late nineties, I think has completely disappeared anyway. But you can you can see how. Uh, uh, within those these archipelagos, there's also uh, uh, those what I call those reef. Uh, those dark blue reefs that are uh, the colonies themselves. Um, yeah, sorry, I could have zoomed in <laughs> much earlier. Um, and uh, and um, and that are that are ramping uh, between all those different islands. And of course, the access between different islands is made more and more difficult years after years. And so this is something that I try to do, like to look at each each of those colony, how they were organized. Uh, uh, some of them are very small, some of them are huge, uh, some of them are pretty much cities. Um, and uh, and you know, of course, um, uh, of course, the, the work of Al Weisman has been influencing me greatly, uh, especially when I was just starting to um, uh, to engage with uh, with the topic and. Uh, Two books like *A Civilian Occupation* and uh, *Whole Land* have been instrumental in us, in understanding how architecture is fully part of this. But again, if we look at the proximity, again, this proximity, this distance, uh, uh, very dear to ETH uh, from from violence, uh, we can see how the colonies are extremely close. This is taken from the the backyards of a Palestinian house in Bethlehem, looking at uh, East Jerusalem and the Israeli colony of Har Alma. Uh, with here uh, a version of the walls that is actually not the concrete uh, part that we usually know, but uh, something with a road with a patrol uh, that comes very often, and then uh, a million of uh, technological sensors of, of sort. Um, similarly, uh, uh, when you're in Ramallah, in the south of Ramallah, you have very much the neighboring of uh, the Israeli colony of Sagat. Um, that is sort of like looking over uh, the Palestinian city from uh, from its hilltop, and then uh, clo closer to Hebron, you have uh, those military um, apparatus between the Israeli colonies and Palestinian villages uh, that are very much quite literally watching uh, Palestinians uh, in their in their villages, 
uh, including you see, you see like this is just a photo I took from the road and you had like uh, uh, two soldiers on a, on a jeep uh, with uh, a profusion almost comical in that case like it looks like a work of art like or a Banksy or whatever <laughs> uh, with the amount of, uh, of cameras you have on the, on this watchtower for example but then Hebron itself Al Khalil uh, in the south of the West Bank the biggest city of the West Bank is uh, a very intensified, uh, small-scale version of all this colonial apparatus. And the colony, in that case, uh, is very much above the old city, uh, so much literally above that um, Palestinians have to uh, protect themselves with those uh, sort of uh, 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 nets uh, on which uh, settlers are throwing an object above, above their head. Um, and, uh, and this sort of... Um, and this sort of uh, buffer between uh, the colony and the Palestinian city itself, uh, this is uh, this is a checkpoint in this part of the city that's been stolen from Palestinians uh, um, uh, four decades ago. Uh, but if you look at the time lapse, this this is a photo I took in 2015, and this is the same checkpoint in 2023 uh, with uh, a remote code, uh, not a remote control, sorry, an AI. Uh, operated a uh, machine gun here on top of the of the turnstile. Um, if we get a little bit closer uh, from architecture's violence, also you can hardly be closer than than this, uh, and talk about the the apartheid wall and the and the or the apartheid walls to be uh, precise and the checkpoints. Um, we can see, of course, how there's two walls. There's one that surrounds Gaza and one that uh, tries to um dive as much as possible uh east in the eastern part of the of the west bank to try to bring as many israeli colonies on the western side of the wall as possible so that they're even more easily connected to the rest uh to 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 uh, to israel than um uh than if they than if um settler settlers had to go through a checkpoint even though when they go through a checkpoint it's usually pretty fast uh, and so this wall, you can see, you can see its trace here. So uh, uh, this is a, uh, uh, yeah. Sorry, it's going to be a little bit hard to take questions in the middle of the in. So, but there's going to be some time after that. Um, and so, and so this wall again, you can you can see it, of course, at a geopolitical level, but uh, you can also see it as a. Um, uh, Again, at going back to what is a wall architecturally and the checkpoints, then uh, can be seen as as keys, as doors and keys. Uh, this is in uh, East Jerusalem in Shufat, uh, as a This is a refugee camp behind uh, that that still is on the on the Jerusalem city lim city limits, but uh, within the city limits, but uh, that is uh, very much cut from the entire rest of the city by the apartheid wall. Um, this is also in East Jerusalem, in Abu Dis. This is uh, essentially what you see when you come out of the campus of uh, Al Quds University. Um, uh, so actually, perhaps I should say this is uh, the wall seen from the western side of the wall. So, uh, but both sides are East Jerusalem, nonetheless. It doesn't matter. But uh, this is the view you might have if you do have a permit as a as a Palestinian uh, from the West Bank who have a permit, which is uh, a, a small fraction of them, uh, or if or if you're a East Jerusalem inhabitant, and in that case you're on the other side of the wall, and uh, and so is uh, Al Quds University campus. Uh, and then, as I said, you have you have the door and keys that uh, checkpoints and bodies, uh, in particular this one, the Kalandia uh, checkpoints, that is the main the biggest checkpoint of the West Bank that uh, very much creates a junction between all the, let's call it the central area of, um, I mean, all the region of Ramallah, uh, of, so all the central area of the West Bank uh, to Jerusalem, uh, with most Palestinian, at least most Palestinian, uh, all Palestinian men uh, having to go through uh, by foot um, and, uh, and go through the very uh, tedious and uh, quite often humiliating uh, 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 process of going through checkpoint and uh, and the turnstile in particular as an architectural invention would 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 sort of very much uh, deserve also to have like an entire uh, 
work done around them and in the way the Israeli soldiers who operate the checkpoints are quite often let it, leaving you like stuck in the checkpoint, like pretty much like in this sort of uh, small area here where you cannot you cannot go to the next space, but you cannot go back to the to the previous space as well. So when talking about the distance of architecture as violence, you again you cannot really get quite as close as that. And then, of course, there's a wall in Gaza that has been uh, very much enacting the, the siege and the blockade uh, on Gaza with its uh, remote control machine guns and its snipers in their watchtowers that are uh, um, able to, um, uh, to again, enact uh, this, uh, this siege. Um, and and uh, um, and the checkpoints as well, and there are, of course, uh, there used to be a few uh, or along those those um, this wall, but now there's only the, the one of uh, Eretz, uh, and uh, that is most of the time closed, and then uh, and then the one between Rafa in Egypt and Rafa in in Palestine, uh, that is also uh, extremely uh, complicated to to go through. The prison itself is also like the prison was clearly what was missing from the teaching. But again, uh, since I was dependent on my role of uh, only, only being only describing what I have been documenting myself, this was not an example I could really talk about. But then the key again is the, the door, the doors, uh, sorry, the walls, the doors, the key, uh, the most sort of uh, optimal. Um, type architectural typology that embodies violence on bodies is very much the prison whereby um, uh, someone is is left without the key in a in a in in, in the immediate distance of of the architecture's violence, uh, and of course it is very much uh, an important uh, apparatus within the settler colonial scheme. Um, uh, this one is the prison of Gilboa uh, in. Um, in the Galilee that we'll go back to in at the end of the talk. Uh, this one is in the West Bank uh, itself, uh, the offer prison with this weird little Israeli billboard. I'm always I'm always a little bit yeah, I never know what to think about it every time I see it, to be honest. Uh, um, uh, but some things Something to realize, I mean, you know, prisons are always a political apparatus that uh, are meant to very much disappear an entire part of the population that uh, we don't want to be uh, uh, active within society. But in the case of this, in, in the settler colonial context, it very much uh, um, is pushed to to the point where um, uh, where yeah any anyone who, who sort of resists the settler colonial order including children uh, uh would be would be put in prison and to give you a stat is like since uh, since the first intifada uh, in uh, in 87 uh, 40% of uh Palestine, of uh, men in the uh, palestinian men in the west bank have been going have been to prison at one point or another 40 40% 40 uh, 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 which shows very much the extent to which the prison is very much a sort of mundane, almost apparatus of settler colonialism, just like all of the others, all of these others. And then the curfew itself, I think, is important to add to this because this is there's been there's many many curfews in the West Bank, in particular during the the Second Intifada, the first and the second. Uh, and and in that case, uh, it's a colonial regime is able to use to use um, Palestinians' own infrastructure, namely their homes, as prisons to to keep them uh, to to keep them within it. So I think this is also something that is interesting in how a home is not necessarily uh, uh, can be very much instrumentalized, as we as we'll see in just a second as well. Uh, uh, and and the walls that are meant to be protective, let's say. Um, also, again, there's always a question about protective of whom and against what. Uh, uh, that is that is important to to question. And then the curfew as a sort of martial law is an important uh, um, legal apparatus that able that 
totally change the function through which architecture operates. And so if we go to the to chapter three now, and when there is no longer any a distance from architecture's violence, and of course, uh, this is an all too literal uh, uh, understanding of how um, in the in the murderous genocidal bombardments that have been happening since 2008 in uh, in since December 2008 uh, against Gaza um, uh, as Eyal Weizmann as well has been uh, has been pointing out um, in particular in his book called the, the list of all possible evils uh, when people die in the bombs usually they die in the fact that the building collapse on the uh, collapse onto itself and and uh, and so uh, um, there's something uh, absolutely dramatically literal about this the sort of how architecture is literally falling on you and but quite importantly whenever we see this kind of images <clears throat> sorry <coughs> i'm sorry mm. When we see this, those kind of images that we are sort of, we've seen so many, of course, in the past six months, there is a temptation to, to see disorder in them, to see chaos because of the rubble, because of, um, because of the sort of um, the sort of conditions of life it creates. But some things that I've been trying to argue in this little book called uh, Bulldozer Politics, the Israeli, the Palestinian Ruin as an Israeli project, is how. Uh, in the way the Israeli have been destroying Palestinian homes since 1948, there is something that is as precise of an order as an architectural project. So everything that I've just shown about how uh, the Israeli state builds, designs and builds a, a settler colonial apparatus with, of course, great, uh, great details as uh, any architectural project uh, does, well, the same sort of precision of uh, of um, the same precision uh, and the same order goes in the destruction of Palestinian homes. And so what I will do very, because, you know, it's, it again, this is also something that can take an entire talk in itself. Um, what I will try to do very quickly is how, is, is do what I do in the book, which is to go um, uh, uh, counter, counter chronologically and start with what when I was writing the book was the last uh, massive murderous uh, uh, attack on Gaza that has been in um, July and August two thousand fourteen, and probably many of us remember very well, and uh, all already not being able to sleep at night, and and already being able to just feeling incredibly powerless, and and all that. Uh, and so, but some some this. Some things that I've been trying to do uh, back at that time was to show the various legal or rather pseudo legal narrative that the Israeli army and the Israeli state were able to uh, tell as stories almost to uh, justify the murders of uh, thousands of Palestinians. And in particular, this idea of, um, uh, again, if we think in terms of the distance to violence, uh, uh, in in increasing uh, dr drastically the the area that is usually only the the hundred meters uh, between um, uh, between the wall and um, uh, and within within Gaza to increase it of three kilometers and to declare that anyone who was in this zone could be pretty much shot and bombarded. Uh, which is, of course, what they did uh, 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 in the past six months in uh, pushing more and more people towards Rafa in the south of the Gaza Strip in with a clear agenda to evict uh, as many Palestinians to Egypt as possible, creating what would be an absolutely disastrous uh, uh, Nakba, second Nakba. Uh, and uh, this kind of narrative as well, as I said, like the the home can cannot be interpreted strictly, it cannot be left to some sort of uh, political innocence. In the case of those kind of narrative, they're being interpreted uh, by the Israeli army, or at least they want us to interpret them as uh, homes uh, that are also, um, um, that are also uh, military, um, 
military headquarters or whatever, however they want to to turn it. But so they are they're 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 instrumentalizing uh, the very architecture of the home as being a military target essentially. And then you know, uh, uh, going back to the West Bank, seeing how uh, um, a lot of the collective punishment uh, that the Israeli state have been enacting in uh, here again in complete contravention of international legislation, but uh, you know, again, what's new uh, has been to destroy uh, houses uh, of um, uh, of the family of people who've been. Um, who've been uh, either shot or arrested as uh, after having led an attack against the Israeli state or against Israeli uh, uh, citizens. Um, and so they, they would destroy homes. Uh, and and this is why it's called the bulldozer politics, the book, because uh, the bulldozer is very much the absolute paradigm of those destruction, of those precise destruction. And, and of course, the sort of <clears throat> the... Um, uh, the way that the D9 Caterpillar uh, uh, bulldozer has been uh, customized by the Israeli army is now extremely well known uh, with the help, of course, of the U.S. army that has been also customizing its own for uh, invading Iraq in particular. Um, and, and those D9s have been absolutely um, uh, disastrous in the siege of Jenin, of the Jenin uh, uh, refugee camp during the Second Intifada in 2002, where they leveled down uh, the entire uh, the entire uh, refugee uh, camp. So whenever today you see news about the Israeli army penetrating again in the Jenin uh, refugee camp because there are Palestinian militants with uh, uh, that are uh, armed and uh, uh, and trying to trying to to fight against uh, the colonial army. Um, this this entire camp had been destroyed in two thousand two already. Uh, and then in Rafa as well. So we talked we talk about Rafa and Rafa is in all of our mind at the at the moment. Sim similarly in 2005 during the Second Intifada as well, uh, the D9 bulldozers have been destroying uh, over 5,000 Palestinian homes uh, um, in uh, again in the south of the Gaza Strip. Yeah, and and so that that brings us back also as Rafa as a continuum of of demolition. Um, in many ways, I mean, I, maybe I, I won't go too much into detail, but I particularly look at the at the nineteen seventy one um, campaign that uh, uh, that Ariel Sharon, who back then was a general, not not yet a minister, but and not yet prime minister of Israel, but uh, a general in charge of the entire south of of Palestine. Um, and so he also destroyed uh, 5,000 uh, Palestinian homes in Rafah in the Palestinian in the refugee camp to try to create um, streets within the camp that would be wide enough to bring tanks, uh, very much in a sort of Hosmanian uh, 19th century uh, reformation of of Paris to avoid insurrections. Um, so. This is something important. And then if we go back a little bit more in time, 1967, the Naxa again, uh, um, the Israeli army invade, uh, uh, invades the entire West Bank and East Jerusalem. And, you know, the entire old city of Jerusalem is in East Jerusalem. And so uh, literally the nights after the invasion, uh, Israeli bulldozers, in that case, a little bit smaller, as you can see, although this one is probably just to um, uh, evacuate the debris. Uh, destroyed the entire Maghrebi uh, uh, neighborhood in that is uh, adjacent to uh, the Western Wall. Uh, 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 that uh, you know, so many uh, uh, Jewish pilgrim pilgrims are uh, visiting uh, today, and that you might see yourself if you ever visit uh, the old city. So there, there used to be an entire Palestinian neighborhood uh, right in front of it that has been completely leveled to the ground in just three nights after. After the invasion, because the Israeli uh, state was afraid that the UN would intervene, and actually never did. Um, and then, of course, forty-eight as the Nakba, being the paradigm of those destruction uh, of uh, Palestinian neighborhoods, such as this one in Haifa, uh, completely evicted and and uh, and uh, buildings abandoned or destroyed, um, like here in um, in Lifta in uh, in Jerusalem. 
of an entire an entire village uh, left uh, as a ruin. Uh, or here in um, in um, in Lid, uh, but here again, it's imp it's interesting to look at the date. Uh, this one I took in two thousand nineteen, and then this is uh, the same photo of just four years later in last year. You can see they built like this street on the left, and then put some very ugly uh, corrugated metal uh, around that uh, ruin of a Palestinian. Um, uh, uh, market um, market building, uh, and this is something important as well. Is that it's not, it's not just that uh, buildings were destroyed uh, and then left as ruin. Quite often, the ruins themselves were had been completely annihilated, uh, such as uh, in those example of uh, photos that uh, Bruno Fer took uh, all around Palestine. And so uh, and so again, like it's it's also the self. The self-fulfilling prophecy of uh, of that uh, of that um, land without people uh, that uh, is therefore legitimate to colonize. Uh, uh, it's a it's a land without an architecture of the indigenous people. And so to conclude, because it's been it's been uh, quite a quite a bit of a, quite a long talk so far. Uh, I want to finish with some things that were perhaps when the distance to uh, architecture's violence is such that uh, perhaps the only uh, the only thing what can do about it is to actually um, resist and this is what what I call spoon theory I said I'm very uh, obsessed with uh, keys but I'm also quite obsessed with spoons and of course it is an homage to the six uh, Palestinian political prisoners who escaped from the Jiboa prison uh, uh, in uh, May 2023 uh, May 2022, sorry. Uh, oops, sorry, I'm having a, a brain fart. Uh, uh, just by by uh, digging a tunnel, um, uh, digging a tunnel um, under the walls and uh, escaping from the prison. I, I love this photo and how the Israeli uh, police officers are absolutely mesmerized in front of that of that hole. Uh, all the all the way to the point of becoming like a, another symbol of uh, Palestinian resistance, just like the key, but for very different reasons. And the key of return for very different reasons than the the the, the ones that I've been explaining about the key. Um, and of course, the spoon in in other ways is also um, can be also interpreted as uh, as the destruction of those walls that I've been talking about, uh, including very much the one that uh, uh, those. A newspaper seems to be uh, making a big fuss about me uh, promoting each time, uh, which is uh, the against uh, in that case a different bulldozer uh, um, opening up uh, the the prison wall uh, around around Gaza, the siege wall, uh, on October seventh, twenty twenty three. Um, uh, this I I still see this photo very much for exactly what it shows. Uh, this. Uh, this prison wall being being opened all in Sanam. But I also want, what I like with the spoon as well is that it's, you know, and of course here that's, uh, 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 the spoon is also the the spoon that we use as a, as a utensil for food and, uh, and uh, thinking very much of uh, uh, Eid happening uh, today and uh, wishing everyone a beautiful Eid. Uh, today as well, but I like also how to think of the spoon as something a little bit less perhaps testosterone than what I just made it to be, uh, and um, and something that talk that tells us about time, about patience, about how you know as I said at the beginning is like a wall is made in such a way that bodies cannot really affect them. It's only true if you consider a scale of times that is not exactly uh, that is sort of like the mediate scale of times that we tend to think about. That is not at all the kind of scale of times that people in prison, for example, um, uh, experience. And this is something we talk about in the in the prison uprising uh, issues that we just uh, I mean that we released a couple of months ago. Um, and so, if we are to consider as a spoon, perhaps at the scale of of history and colonialism, then as 
almost obscene as it may uh, seem in in a moment in a in a moment of genocidal violence such as the one we're um, witnessing it's it may be a little bit weird to say such a thing but uh, uh, which is that colonialism will be vanquished at some point um, uh, and even though it might not it might require quite a bit of patience but that's the patience at the spoon sort of a promise so to speak uh, and so I like I like this idea, and I like I like to finish uh, uh, with this. And you know, I realize in the middle of the of the lecture as well um, that there is one slide missing. I, I would have had a hundred slides instead of my ninety nine, uh, uh, which is also the great march of the great march of return uh, that happened in Gaza in twenty eighteen and twenty nineteen, where um, when uh, uh, thousands of people marched towards the the the, the wall, the, the siege wall, uh, and were shot in the legs quite often, or even were killed uh, by Israeli snipers. Uh, and when I say shot in the leg, it sounds like an American movie that has like uh, you know uh, where uh, the the main character gets to walk again after after ten minutes of the movie. We're talking about massive bullets that absolutely. Uh, just completely destroy uh, any sort of um, any sort of chance for the person to ever walk again with with that leg. Um, and I like this idea of marching towards also the wall. Like I was saying, how this whole distance, like most of the time, it's the wall marching towards you, so to speak, and and so tightening on on you. Uh, but somehow, if you uh, there, there's been Palestinian people have been showing us how. Uh, sometimes you can reverse that movement and march towards the wall itself, and I find it a particularly poignant example to finish with, although that would have been nice to include it as a slide. So uh, anyway, I thank you very much for your patience, and then you can ask questions in the Q&A that our dear friends in Zurich will uh, ask for you. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you, Leopold, for this amazing presentation. I think uh, you talked about the violence of architecture, but I think we and we can see the violence of architecture not only in Palestine and in contexts of colonization, but we can think about it from our position here today. We have not found the space at the university, at the institution. And actually now we are sitting in a squat to listen to this presentation and to participate in it. So in a way, first of all, in the past six months, many people have uh, held the slogan that Palestine liberates us all, or, or that we will never be free until Palestine is free. And actually, we see that in a, in a time like today when the limits to the fantasy or to the claim to critical scholarship is exposed at a time specifically when it's Palestine that is the issue in question. So in a way, when people say that we are not free until Palestine is free, it is actually because we are never, we have never been free, but it is actually issues like Palestine that expose our chains that are otherwise hidden. But at this, when we talk about the violence of architecture, and as I said at the beginning, we are speaking about the emancipatory potential of architecture. We are here maybe 40 people in one of the rooms in Zurich. There's another one. And I guess there are many others of collective, uh, collective screenings for this uh, presentation worldwide. And it also says something about the power of architecture. All of us who are sitting here, even though we had the chance to listen to this uh, uh, presentation on Zoom in a virtual room, we have decided to come together to sit in a room, in a physical room next to each other, and to listen and to participate physically right here, right now. And I think this also says what architecture can be and what academia can be and what critical scholarship really, when it's truly really critical and truly free,
can also be. So on the one hand, we have seen the violence of architecture. Violence is also context instances. It is as if any form of violence is equal to the other. Colonized violence is equal to colonial violence. This is the claim. But of course, we know that this is not true. But even then, also, we see the power of architecture as a liberate, liberatory tool. And this is what I think of the space we are in now. So on that note, uh, I think we can all here thank you for your presentation, but also thank the students who organized this and thank all the participants who have come and showed their solidarity in person, also showing what, again, architecture and the true academia can be. So thank you all. Thank you very much. Um, I might I might just uh, address um, that last that last bit on architecture and its liberatory uh, um, possibilities. Let's say, and and of course I, I I I agree with you with what's what's going on, so to speak. I agree with you with your observation, but I I think of it myself. I I think as the absolute impossibility for architectures to be liberatory myself, uh, because I, I believe that it is um, uh, an instrument of uh, of control of bodies. And so as such, it can, it can never be liberatory. But what it does, however, is that including in a space like the one you're in right now, is to, is to use that sort of protocols of inclusion of exclusion to also exclude those who want us harm quite simply and so this to me is a political program we can apply to architecture and and with a full understanding of architecture's violence but which is again like this idea of protection and everything but protection against for whom and against what is always the question if it more often than not it will always be protection for the same kind of people against the same kind of people uh, but every now and then we're able to create our own space where uh, we are indeed managing to care for each other and to and to protect each other, uh, including uh, the most vulnerable ones against um, uh, yeah those who want us harm to to use that expression. So that would be my my interpretation of it, so to speak, within that architectural definition of the discipline that organizes bodies in space. Okay, thanks, okay, Leopold. Thanks, Leopold. Yeah. Again, and maybe we can start with the questions written in the Q and A section, and then go to the room and ask for uh, any input here. Would you like to read them yourself, or actually, uh, I, I can? No, I'll let yeah. you. I'll let you choose which one you, which one you're, you're feeling the. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. Okay. Okay. We couldn't hear you before, but I will. I will read the question. Uh, so we have a question from saying, "I was wondering what political conclusions we should take away from the university's censorship of this course." In my opinion, the censorship of academia is no coincidence, but a consequence of the university's role as an or as the ideological supporter of Western imperialism. Therefore, I came to the conclusion that it is necessary to fight against imperialism to free Palestinians from their oppression, which is obviously also perpetrated by architecture. This, this is being attempted by the Revolutionary Communist International all over the world. What have you taken from this experience in the political sense? This experience being the censorship. Yeah, that's a super important question. Um... And I want to preface my response by saying I am not affiliated with any university myself. So that is an answer that is coming from a place of great luxury, which is that I do not necessarily need them that much. So please take everything I say with a pinch of salt, so to speak, uh, because, of course, when it comes to people who are uh, dependent on universities for their uh, visa, for their uh, PhD, for their jobs, 
it's a very different uh, it's a very different situation but what i can say myself is that se be having the lecture censored was not a political defeat uh, uh at least not for me it was not my political defeat it was the eth political defeat and it was quite interesting to see that there was a new article today and and i could not help but write again to the i, I wrote to the rector to send to send him the 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 um, the, the letter signed by those uh, 1800 people uh, but I couldn't help but write again to the rector to say, I really hope you understand now that nothing you could have done would have satisfied those uh, idiots. Um, uh, uh, so, um, uh, so instead of like damaging your own sort of academic integrity of sort, if 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 there is such a thing, uh, but this is me talking to him, so I'm I'm obliged to sort of acknowledge that. Otherwise, otherwise we have nothing to tell each other. Uh, 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 but so instead of damaging your your uh, damaging your academic integrity and alienating so many so many people around the world and in your very own university, you should perhaps have thought about that and maybe take a take a strong sense a strong stance. Uh, but of course, this is me being a little bit, uh, again, this is me talking to him. So it's not exactly what I think as in so far as that I, I don't know whether universities are actually uh, really the instrument of Western imperialism, but I certainly think at a, at a, in, a, in a much more prosaic way that universities are machines to reproduce the statu quo uh, and, and including what in the statu quo needs a little bit of sort of liberalism to be able to keep functioning, so to speak. Um, and so, so again, I think in all of those situations, for me, it's very important to, to know what is it we would do, what, what is it we would get, or we would do. We would do is simpler because then we're in full control of it. And I think this is what happened. What is it we would do that would call this entire thing a political victory and i think in that case this is what we did uh quite simply uh i think the the biggest loser of of it all is the university itself um and um and for us you know i mean it's be, uh, we did lose <laughs> quite a bit of time <laughs> i will i will say this uh but uh but we also you know we also created some pretty strong uh uh relationship with the students for example or uh and then and then again this talk that was really which is kind of the funny thing right it was meant to be like something relatively modest and small <laughs> uh and ends up being like uh, online and therefore reach uh, many more people uh so personally, I would consider this, and again, in my very own specific position, uh, with its with its sort of independent this luxury of independence, I would consider it as a as a political victory. Zurich two, do you copy? Do you copy Zurich two? Okay, we lost Zurich two. <laughs> Can you hear us? Yes. Hi, uh, this is Zurich Two talking. We are also here in a room filled with people, filled with solidarity. So first, hi to you and happy eight to everyone. I would also like to express my solidarity with anyone um, standing for the truth and just knowing that such accusations, they go. So what I want to mention Leopold, to you, and it's just a request for you to point out to the issue of distance and violence, these are, of course, the terms uh, very much reflected in feminism and gender. 
And I'm asking this question for you just to explain more, especially to the ones who are listening and are not um, that much familiar with the topic is because newspapers like NZZ and all the other right-wing media, they always accuse Middle East uh, for being, uh, like they use the Orientalist notion terms, they accuse Middle East for being a unsafe place for queer people, they use pinkwashing, that's something we know. Israeli settlement is also using it to uh, as a tool of violence. But I want you to a bit uh, explain for the ones who are maybe not that much familiar is around the notions of distance and the violence that the built environment brings, especially to vulnerable bodies uh, and a bit yeah, around the notion of inclusion. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think this is what was said earlier about um, what is what is true with Palestine is true in many other ways in many other places, and um, you know, uh, uh, I mean, perhaps let me back up a little bit. And you remember how I presented the magazine as being about the politics of space and bodies, and the argument on the weaponization of architecture have been have been trying to articulate it for over 15 years now perhaps even a little bit more uh and in many ways and again as i said i, I had the same definition architecture as uh, uh the discipline that organizes bodies in space but then for a few years after i started i real i mean after a few years sorry i realized that my understanding of bodies were extremely uh, fraud because uh, it was sort of assuming uh, that all of them were sort of equal uh, in a sort of vacuum and then and then it was and then they they had a relationship, a violent relationship with architecture. And of course, we know that it's uh, could not be less true uh, that as a sort of uh, political marginalization that um, various other realms of uh, politics or uh, uh, um, um, like the law and uh, the norm and uh, and many many other uh, aspects are uh, the way the way in which they they're politically marginalizing um, but all bodies with various sort of degrees, uh, of differentiation, well, then architecture is gonna is gonna intensify this um, intensifies this violence uh, very much. So, and I think you know uh, you talked about uh, feminism and and queer um, uh, the the various the various queer epistemologies to which we are all um, uh, very much in debt for forming our the way we think of politics. Uh, but we can and and so very we we can very much so see how uh, architecture is almost always designed with a sort of uh, uh, hetero patriarchal uh, uh, um, normative uh, uh, agenda. But I think uh, if we talk about ableism in particular, then architecture becomes a, a really um, also, an incredibly, an incredibly violent uh, uh, instrument to very much um, enforce the violence of of of, of ableism. Because uh, again, if we accept ableism, just like uh, if we accept ableism as a as a as a social construct and not as a sort of natural uh, uh, state of things, then architect there's there's very few things more than architecture i mean perhaps medicine would be a, a bigger a bigger one but but architecture would be a pretty massive one in the way it um, intensify um this violence and and very very importantly and i guess you said it very well uh you know there there would be a tendency in western europe for example to think that there is uh what we do in the for the feminist struggle for the queer struggle for the anti struggle here and then there's you know the fight against colonialism somewhere else in Palestine in particular when actually those struggles are very much 
at work also in Palestine and and, and ableism uh, of all of all things as well. I mean everything, all this colonial apart architectural apparatus apparatus I showed, of course is already incredibly violent on uh, abled Palestinian bodies, but it is even more so on on disabled bodies. So this is really something to be that needs to be thought with all those sort of uh, layering of uh, politi the, the, the various ways through which politics sort of um, um, deployed certain logics on bodies in general. So uh, I think this is something we, we, we will never stop learning from and working, working or working on. As an extension, maybe to continue on, on that, we have two questions that ask about one virtual architecture or architecture in the virtual world of the internet, but also about um, extending your thoughts on architecture to urbanism, public space, city planning and infrastructure. So can you elaborate a little bit more about the points you have just mentioned in view of virtual architecture, but also urbanism itself? Uh, I mean, in terms of urbanism, for me, that's that's. I mean, I don't. I mean, I I'm very well aware of, of course, the fact that there's different scales uh, of application of architecture, and it's also talking about uh, gender. It's quite interesting, also, how you know uh, the sort of the the territory, geography, uh, uh, big geopolitical. Uh, interpretation of territories uh, and even the city, perhaps the city will be the buffer perhaps, uh, will always be sort of uh, uh, handled by by sort of male scholars and everything. And then the interiors and the more sort of, uh, uh, the more mundane and the more, uh, um, uh, the, the closer to, to bodies uh, 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 we get. And um, I think that's perhaps what's uh, also the, the previous question was very much about would be would be more looked at by feminist studies or queer studies and and to not create that continuum uh, between different scales would be absolutely ridiculous and 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 uh, and again like reinforcing the sort of patriarchal way of of producing knowledge quite simply um but so yeah, so the city for me is just as much a scale of space that um, needs to be analyzed in such a way. As for the virtual space, I have to say myself, I, because I started literally by talking about Spinoza and the hyper materiality of the way I think about all this. So for me, that's my sort of approach, which is in absolutely, it's absolutely not a commentary on whether it's interesting or not interesting to, to look at other form of space, but that's definitely, not my uh, i mean it's not even that it's not my expertise it's literally my uh some things that i've i've never really thought about although i would i would certainly argue since we were talking about the space we're in right now that uh there is something to be said about the infrastructure of of communications that allows us to do what we do right now but um uh but you know i've i don't have a very strong uh, I don't have a very strong um, um, uh, opinion on the matter, and I'm sure many people have a much more valuable, much more valuable things to say about it. Okay, maybe we okay, give maybe you we... maybe we give you a second to read some of the questions online as we take questions from the room. Okay, Leopold, shall we move to the question from the room? 
Okay. Um, hi. Um, I think when I first started or when I first heard the term <clears throat> architectural violence, the first thing that came to mind was prison or a police station. And I think that's very fair, but also it makes me wonder a lot in terms of um, not, not philosophically, but more architecturally, what were the first thoughts behind creating prisons or what defines prison architecture? Because I think this is something that, um, that was weaponized against or that is still used um, and still weaponized against everyone or a lot of people everywhere. So I'd like to hear some thoughts, please. Yeah, so I think, um, so, you know, the prison as an institution is not an architectural invention. Um, the prison as an architecture is a facilitation of the enforcement of the prison as an institution. So this entire, this entire um, uh, argument is not about saying that uh, architects are the true master of the world and they're uh, like puppet master uh, sort of organizing bodies in space uh, in the way that, in the colonial ways that they see fit. But more that, you know, it's a little bit what I was saying about you can either have like a, re a row of soldiers forcing bodies to do something or you can just have an architecture. And so so similarly for prison, like what prison does as an institution in, 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 an, in many of our contexts, whether it's a sort of non-settler colonial context or in the settler colonial context, uh, can be done through all the means and architecture, but they're not very realistic, so to speak. Like there, you cannot have, you cannot keep someone. I mean, also without architecture doesn't mean anything. Of course, it's just a, a sort of very abstract uh, way of of saying stuff. Uh, um, but you know, again, like you, the idea of what what I mean, I guess that's what exile used to be in many ways. In uh, perhaps at least in in the way uh, Greek tragedy uh, is are presenting it uh, or um, or again when the world was very much built around cities rather than around states then the idea of expelling someone from a city was in many ways doing what the prison as an institution is doing today in uh, in states um uh, if if I if I can be so simplistic um but again, I think someone asked a question about complicity, and I, when it comes to complicity of Europeans with uh, settler, col settler colonialism in Palestine, I think there's a lot to be said, but I personally am not that interested in talking about it at, a, at an individual level. Like, uh, I feel we will live at a time where there's a lot of moral judgment over our own individual as like, are we complicit with this? Are we complicit with that? I'm maybe more interested in general, both in our complicity and in our solidarity to think collectively. And precisely as architects, there is a complicity with those political regime in, in so far that we are willing to provide as a sort of, uh, again, the easy way to enforce such an institution. Um, an argument I've been I've been making for quite a few, quite a few years is to think of the many many Europe, Western European ships that uh, have the that have displaced, uh, kidnapped twelve million uh, uh, African people to carry them on the other side of the uh, of the ocean so that they could be enslaved. Th those boats are architecture, and therefore, without them, the transatlantic slave trade and, uh, in many ways, uh, the settler colonization of uh Abia Yala or the Americas uh, uh is is almost impossible so to speak um and so so we have we have to see this complicity not in 
not in how uh, we are ourselves inventing uh, regime, political regime of violence, political regimes, sorry, of violence, but rather how we provide uh, a very convenient uh, materialization of them uh, through architecture. And so to me, that's very important. And, and that, that also means having also an entire set of political programs we would never accept to design anything for and in particular detention whatever whatever it might be I, I think to me is absolutely crucial uh, Leopold, are there any other questions that you would like to answer from the from here, or should I pick one? Well, one is not a question, but I'll, I'll certainly say it out loud uh, from Helios Petremont, who says the spoon theory also exists in disability justice discourse. Uh, whoa, it disappeared. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> As where did it it's go? in the answer like like Oh, okay, sorry. Oh, yeah. So uh, the spoon theory also exists in disability justice discourse and the limited amount of resources that are at hand. So that's quite quite interesting. The uh, my next book project is called the key and the spoon. So I'll I'll certainly I'll certainly look into it. Thank you, Elios. Um, and I mean, my, my, me scrolling is absolutely in no way a commentary on the quality of the question. It's, it's, it's more whether I would have something useful to say about it or not. Uh, and also Maybe I can highlight mind, a couple of my brain is starting to, if have I can more. highlight a couple of them, yeah, I think it, there's a question it. asks. How do we sharpen our spoons, basically, which I see, con uh, uh, let's say, intersects with others that talk about on the complicity of architecture and the university, but on the other hand, the potential within architecture and the university to, to be something different. So maybe this is like a very brief summary of three questions, but maybe you can tell us more, possibly through the metaphor of sharpening the spoon. I, I definitely got the 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 metaphor of sharpening the the tool, the, the spoon, but what was the, I think it it cut it cut off a little bit on my end. So what was the other? There was there was a question about basically. Well, okay, there was a question about the complicity of architecture asking. Is the architecture of prisons or of checkpoints or et cetera something that architects actually study within the university or is or where does this kind of develop? Um, but there were other questions that ask, okay, besides the let's say the complicity of architecture and the complicity of academia, are there other roles that these disciplines or these institutions or these fields can assume and how can they assume them that counter? let's say, colonialism and the violence we're talking about here. Okay. Um, well, about the second first, uh, I don't think it really matters even whether there are actually people who have an architectural degree who are designing checkpoints in Palestine or or whether it's just, it's most likely it's like the internal to the military uh, sort of in engineer core or something like that. I mean, I, I don't know. I actually don't know, but it really doesn't matter because we don't have to care about who can call themselves an architect or not. Architects are just the people who design things uh, uh, in advance of, of their re realization. Um, and so perhaps moving on to the sharpening of the of the spoon, I kind of want to go against this metaphor, so to speak, because I feel that it, it is a little bit perhaps trying to um, 
again put back some testosterone in in the in the spoon when I like the idea that is it has a little bit more of a like I'm I'm not sure like the sharpening of the spoon in the context of a prison escape would be used perhaps to to take the guards into hostage or in hostage or something like that but it would not I don't think a, a sharpened a sharpened uh, spoon would actually dig a, ton, a better tunnel. So you know, I said that in a very literal way, but I mean it in a metaphorical and epistemological way. Um, and then for the third question, again, I mean, I also want to be very clear about the fact that my approach to architecture is very specific, uh, and I've. Give, I've given you the axiom of that thinking. And so everything I say is within this sort of approach. And of course, there are many other ways to approach it. So it's not me trying to make a, a theory that works with, with everything or anything like that would be ridiculous. But within this approach, again, architecture is a weapon. And as many, if many weapon, um, it's mostly used to it's mostly used to control and 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 harm those who are uh, harmed the most uh, commonly in a given political order, and so I don't think there's a possibility to use for education. It's a little bit different, I feel, but I, I'll, I'm also really not of an an education a, a thinker of education. So I, I my my guess is as good as pretty much anyone. I, I don't have any anything useful to say about that. But for architecture, I think um, that the only way we can use it for ourselves, for our own politics, is to uh, is to already accept that there are so many things it cannot do, and in particular, in particularly, it cannot liberate. Uh, um, and I think once we have accepted that, then we're able to to say, okay. What does that mean for us again, like to create a space that is protected from uh, outside um, threats of or or things like that? and 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 of course, it's very limited, but I think it's okay that it's very limited. I think in general, uh, anyone who's practicing practicing, sorry, uh, our our uh, architecture um, uh, should be anyway have a much more humble relationship to this to this practice and therefore accept that there's only a very limited range of things we can uh, we can do Okay, so um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> it's uh, I mean I'm 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 quite amazed that there's still uh, uh, including the collective screening, perhaps about three hundred people still not tired of of listening to me and to my voice. But um, but so perhaps I think we should uh, we should end there. And I'm very grateful uh, uh, for everyone again who showed up at this particular moment and. Uh, I will say that uh, I did not uh, I did not expect anything less anything less or anything else to happen. So I'm very grateful uh, to see that uh, such a such a sort of counteraction can be um, can be organized. And uh, with that, I wish you all a beautiful Eid again, and uh, to the people uh, who are in Zurich, and more particularly people who have. To deal with ETH every single day, I uh, wish you a lot of luck, and and it's much more about my solidarity being with you than the other way around. So again, thank you, thank you again very much, and have a beautiful evening.